coming everybody. Um, before I get started I'd just like to thank my two wonderful supervisors who have been so supportive along the way, um, so patient and so trusty and so I just wanted to acknowledge them. What I'm going to do today is just take you through the chapters um, that I'll be writing up, I'm in the process of writing up at the moment. Um, so I start with my theory chapter and move on to my methodology um, then I get stuck into the history where some of the oral histories are included and some of the archival material that has been located. Then I wanted to delve a little bit more deeply into uh, some of the directors um, who've been attached to the, the program, in particular uh, Dr Brian Smith who was the first director. Uh, then I move into the demographic data uh, because I've collected student surveys as well. And in that chapter, I'm going to talk about uh, the reasons that people enrol, which is really quite fascinating. Uh, the next chapter is about the stories of student transformation. So that's where um, I'll take my readers into um, some of the quite interesting um, <coughs> stories that students have, have um, been able to impart to us. Uh, chapter 7 will be about the broader impact, so there I'll talk about the career destinations of the students, but also the impacts uh, for the university and for the regions, the, the Hunter and the Central Coast regions um, more broadly. Uh, chapter 8 will be about embodied learning impacts, because one of the things that struck me in the collection of the survey data um, is how much students actually internalise the experience um, of that learning process. So I'll be probing that a little bit more deeply. And finally, I'll look at the longevity of the program and the <coughs> philosophy of some of the staff, because in fact, um, it's not just a, a student experience, it's also an experience that the, um, that the staff are engaged in as well. So in terms of my theoretical framework, I'm using Bourdieu's uh, concepts of cultural capital, habitus and field um, collectively. Uh, to use any of them individually um, wouldn't give you a sense of um, what's required to explore this material. So um, originally uh, Bourdieu was talking about the different kinds of capitals because if you've got money, um, you know, your economic capital, that can be quite handy. Um, if you've got social networks or family who can enhance your situation, that's useful too or symbolic capital, where you've got some kind of social honour or prestige. Um, but collectively, he often um, uh, included all of those in a sense of cultural capital and, uh, and what, what that can bring you. And so in conjunction with um, some of the other um, theorists of the time, um, he wasn't very clear, Bourdieu, on how to interpret that term. And in fact, um, at one point he said, I really don't like definitions um, at all, but often what you find is that researchers who use the term cultural capital um, explain it as a possession, something innate, something, you know, a value that people have, um, actually possess. Um, and so, you know, if you've got two kids going off to school, um, to kindergarten for the first day, if, if one has the advantages that cultural capital accrues to them, um, they're in a pretty good position to, um, to have a good experience at school. And it's almost like an exponential equation, I guess. Once they get there, um, you know, they can take advantage of other things because they feel comfortable in that in that setting. <coughs> but for people who don't possess cultural capital, um, it sort of compounds their disadvantage. Um, Bourdieu's early work um, refers to cultural capital in terms of linguistic and cultural competence and awareness. Um, but in my thesis. Um, in concert with um, a writer called Tierney, I'm arguing that um, rather than a possession, something people bring with them, that cultural capital actually can be learnt. Um, it's not just something that's um, automatically um, inherited or possessed. And so what I'm arguing is that Open Foundation students come already with a range of um, competencies that might have been their life experiences or um, their work experiences, and that provides additional cultural capital. Um, when Bourdieu refined that um, concept, um, what he suggested was that there are three types in his later writings. There's institutionalised cultural capital, which is um, what you gain from your credentials or your qualifications. Um, there's embodied cultural capital, which is the part that you internalise. Um, and in addition, he said there's objectified cultural capital, which is how you surround yourself with material possessions like books and so on. 
but really for our students I'm looking at the institutionalised and embodied aspects of um, cultural capital and the way um, that it, it enhances people's self-worth and their social position. Um, in addition, Bourdieu assigned a really important role to the what he calls symbolic producers. So in other words, the teachers um, who are involved in producing that. So I'm hoping that in my thesis I can draw out um, a little bit of that framework as well. <coughs> um, Habitus also had some conceptual <coughs> gaps. I've been tracing these concepts from very early days and looking at both the primary and the secondary sources uh, who talk about the concept. And Diane Ray, who's a professor in one of the London universities, <coughs> um, has explained to us that Bourdieu tells us that habitus is durable ways of standing, speaking, walking and feeling and thinking. Um, but it's also a game, people getting what's, what he calls a feel for the game um, that they internalise and then it becomes you know, quite natural to them. So in other words, it's dispositions um, that allow for human agency but they also predispose people um, to certain ways of behaving that are expected um, of people like us. So, um, for example, it's often more difficult for working class people who have no experience of the university to feel comfortable within that setting. They feel, as Bourdieu explained, like a fish out of water sometimes. And I guess one of the things that our program tries to do is break down those barriers and make them feel comfortable within that setting, make them feel that they belong to that setting. Um, so habitus isn't predictable, um, it excludes certain practices that are unfamiliar to people, um, but it's also an embodied phenomena. Um, it's not just mental attitudes and perceptions, it's the way people feel about their experiences. Um, what it also does is demarcates the kind of choices that people make. Um, so I guess those people that have enough faith in themselves to apply to do the program um, really have made it a choice and a decision about where it potentially could take them. Um, and then I guess it's up to um, the program and to their individual habitus um, as to whether they stay in or they opt out. Um, Diane Ray talks about it as an internalised framework that makes some possibilities inconceivable, others improbable and a limited range acceptable. The other concept I'm looking at is field, um, and that gives you that contextual dimension. And so David Schwartz says that fields may be thought of as structured spaces that are organised around specific types of capital. Fields denote uh, arenas of production, circulation, appropriation of goods, services, knowledge or status, and the competitive positions held by actors in their struggle to accumulate and monopolise different kinds of capital. Um, so that, that explains how our uh, students are placed. They're struggling to gain that knowledge um, and to find a place for themselves, um, I guess, within their, their social um, arena. So basically, in terms of field, my thesis is um, focusing on the fact that we're situated within the higher education sector. Within that, we're part of enabling programs that have a very specific role um, within higher education. We're also dealing with adult learning or andragogy um, and that concept of lifelong learning um, because a lot of my students um, over time have been um, older people. In fact, um, the range of people in my uh, student survey is from 20 right through to 78. Um, so that concept of lifelong learning I think is becoming even more important today. But it's also transformative learning that takes place. Um, a theorist by the name of Jack Mesereau um, talked a lot about that term because um, you know, what happens often to our students is um, transformative. So um, I'll be dealing with that aspect as well when I'm setting up my um, theoretical framework. In terms of my methodology, um, I've conducted oral histories. And Robert says that oral history gives voice to that which is missing or underreported in official records. And so I'm saying that through remembering and reinterpreting um, the past history of Open Foundation um, and using the words of um, 38 former administrators, long-term lecturers and support staff, mm. what I'm doing is providing some really interesting insights, um, but also the, the qualitative comments that the students make, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the lived experiences and memories of the respondents draw on their own journeys, as well as um, their memories of the students. Um, who've gone down that open foundation pathway. 
In fact, um, it was a delight collecting those interviews. It was such fun because along the way there'd be lots of bursts of laughter. People would um, burst out laughing and um, the transcriptions later recorded and, and bracketed laughs and you'll see in a moment um, what I mean by that. And what they do is they highlight you know, some of those really funny things that have happened um, along the way. And in fact, um, something that was quite remarkable was a lot of people that, uh, that actually knew Brian Smith would go into Brian Smith speak. He had an English accent, um, and suddenly they would be Brian Smith, and so that was really quite interesting as well. So what I'm saying is that the oral histories give voice to the program in ways that official accounts never could. So the humanity, the laughter, the subversions um, that make Open Foundation memorable um, are included. When I gave a, a paper, a Fedora uh, seminar at my campus down at Arimba, I said to them, you're really only interested in the subversions, aren't you? And they said to me, you know us too well. <laughs> so you'll hear some of those as well in this presentation. Um, I also conducted, oh, well, the, the oral histories were semi-structured because I wanted to give people the latitude um, to talk about things that they wanted to discuss as well. So in general, the kind of questions that I asked them um, well, how and when did they become involved with the program? What were their recollections about the origins and about um, Brian Smith? Um, why did the program's name change over time? Um, I asked them about their vivid memories of Open Foundation um, and did they remember stories about the students or conversations about uh, the program in general? I asked them about what observations they'd make about, uh, made about the impact on students and also how significant they thought the program was to the University of Newcastle. Um, in addition, I was interested in the impact the programs had on the regions, and so I've asked my respondents um, also um, about that. Then at the end, um, I'd ask them whether they thought there was anything I'd forgotten to ask them, which actually caused them to reflect over um, you know, the way that I'd structured the questions, but to give them the opportunity about thinking through my project and anything else um, that might have occurred. Um, so those questions were adapted generally for those different levels, for the, um, the administrators, for the long-term lecturers, um, and from the, for the support workers within the program. So there were some variations, but in general, um, they were the main questions. Um, in terms of the student surveys, I was able to collect 350 student surveys. We have a register now um, called the Pepper Register, the Potential um, Enabling um, Research Register. <coughs> um, and um, what I was interested in there was asking students about their experiences before they came to the program, what happened while they were in it, um, and what happened afterwards. So the kinds of questions um, that I asked, I want to know their sex, and in fact about 78% of my respondents were female, um, their country of birth, whether they're Indigenous, I had five Indigenous respondents which gave voice to, um, to that group, uh, whether they came to the program with a disability, what kind of course they did, how old they were, um, what year they'd enrolled, um, and in fact I was able to gather some respondents as far back as 1976 right through to 2012. Um, so I've got a, a, you know, quite a reasonable yeah. representation of people that experienced the program at different times. I asked them about their prior educational qualifications, um, how did they hear about the program, why did they enrol, what subjects they went into, what year they completed, um, their experience, whether they made enduring friendships. And in fact, interestingly, of those 350 people, 55% of them made enduring friendships. I didn't know, want to know about ordinary friendships, I wanted to know whether those friendships endured because that's actually got implications for their social capital, their networking, and uh, that came through the qualitative responses that they really <coughs> did um, have those, um, those kinds of networks that were set up from the common experience of doing Open Foundation. I asked them if it changed their lives, what degree they went into, um, when they graduated, what career they undertook. Some of them were still in the process of completing their degree, but I've collated <coughs> some of the details of what career destinations they, um, they moved into, which are quite fascinating. Um, was there any economic improvement? Um, did they have social or uh, familial changes? And if so, you know, what kinds? Any other changes? Um, and whether they'd be you know, interested in being interviewed. Um, in terms of the history of the program in Chapter 3, um, 
Joe's work previously talked about the importance of the context of looking internationally, nationally and locally. Um, so it's not just the program as it runs on the, on the ground. How is it situated in that much broader context? Um, and in Jo's argument, she says that internationally, um, you know, that idea of globalisation is starting to become common. Um, the idea of becoming a knowledge-based society, that education was a really important feature um, of societies, a right for everybody. Also, that concept I've mentioned before of lifelong learning was starting to be talked about. Um, along with the notion of widening participation. And so, um, for example, the un Open University in Britain, um, you know, was very much um, attached to that idea of um, providing opportunities for people um, from lower socioeconomic circumstances to enter universities and breaking down um, that kind of elitist concept of what a university might previously have been thought to be. Um, nationally, it was the, the heady years of the Whitlam government, which were reformist, um, so they were abolishing the university fees and creating more places, so um, that was an interesting time, and the program started in 1974, so we were right um, in the middle of that era. And then locally, um, Newcastle was undergoing change as well. Um, there'd been an economic downturn. Um, there was um, a rise in unemployment rates um, and so this need to reskill the workforce was taking place. And in fact Brian Smith commented that he detected a change in aspirations um, of Newcastle people. Um, I remember <coughs> one of the interviews I was inclined to ask somebody, do you think there was a Newcastleness about the Open Foundation? Um, and uh, people did seem to think that there was something, you know, about how, um, you know, Newcastle um, culture tends to operate that contributed to um, the success <coughs> of the Open Foundation program. <coughs> in terms of a timeline then, um, we became autonomous as a university in 1965. In 1970, Professor Laurie Short, who I was able to interview, um, was involved in a committee <coughs> um, that looked at promoting adult education in the region. And so that went to Academic Senate and they decided um, that you know, we would offer an adult education program and that's how we, we um, were able to get um, Dr John Turner. He'd worked in Sydney previously in adult education. He came up to Newcastle at that point. Um, in 72, uh, Laurie Short reported to Senate um, that a community um, programs department should be established. Um, which would have quite a broad focus and that somebody at the level of maybe an associate professor or professor um, should be um, appointed to that position by open selection. So JJ Ockmuti, who was our vice chancellor at the time, wanted the program to be a resource for the community. Um, he wanted it to promote intellectual values, specialised knowledge, research and development of um, community problems and also to provide facilities for theatre, music and the arts. And so John acted in that position until they were able to find a suitable candidate. Um, that person who was the first director was Brian. Um, he had an ANU from, um, an ANU, he had a PhD from the ANU. Um, he'd written a book, interestingly, um, called Memory. Uh, his PhD was based on that, that notion of philosophical view of memory. So I found it quite ironic that I was collecting memories of him when he'd already been interested in that field. Um, but Brian was a former mature age student himself, so he was very much committed um, to uh, the concept of an Open Foundation program. Chapter 4 is going to look at those directors. So we started out with Brian. His um, uh, tenure of that position was till 1987 under community programs. And his protege, John Collins, um, who was also one of my Open Foundation lecturers, um, was in the position until 1995, still um, under the, the guise of community programs. But then there was a bit of a morphing that happened within the university and um, in that period, 95 to 97, it became continuing and professional education. Uh, Dr. Ralph Robinson took up the directorship in 1997 through to 2002 um, under that title. But then in 2002, um, Seamus Fagan came on board and it began to be called the English Language and Foundation Studies Centre. So you can see a change from that um, commitment to community, I guess, to a more educative um, role as time went by. Um, I was fortunate to be able to speak to Sybil Smith, Brian's wife, and so 
um, she was able to recount some very interesting stories about Brian, about his biography. Um, so you can see a picture there of Brian walking along smoking a cigarette, which was very characteristic of him. And in fact, in one of my other interviews, um, someone had observed that Brian knew exactly how long a lecture would take because he'd roll up six durries and have them in a row. And by the time he'd finished them, then he knew he could let the students have a break and then he'd roll up another six while he was in the break. Um, very, very interesting man. Also interesting because he, he had an interest in the arts. He used to be an amateur um, producer of um, dramatic productions and so um, you know, that desire of the university to include us more, um, you know, sort of in the arts scene was certainly um, something that he was interested and experienced in. Um, I think he'd been one of the organisers of the Festival of Perth too, so that would have been something on his resume that attracted our university um, towards him as a candidate for that job. Um, here you can see Brian again rolling up a cigarette. This was a photograph that Sybil um, provided for me. Um, but you'll notice that he's wearing a sort of caramel coloured suit and quite a number of my respondents noted that he was often seen in, in that, well not probably exactly that suit, um, but that coloured suit and um, Sybil was telling me that one of the... <laughs> Sybil told me that um, one of the things he used to do was make his own bow ties. Um, he'd go out and select the material and he had a little pattern for them, and then he'd get on the sewing machine and sew up the bow ties that went um, with that suit. And I remember, um, as a student myself in 1985, seeing him walking the corridors, um, you know, pretty much uh, probably in that suit, um, and with the bow ties um, to, um, as well. Okay, so in terms of um, the history of the program, I asked um, John Collins a bit about that because he'd been there right from the very beginning. He was appointed as um, a tutor um, at the outset. And so when I asked him that question, he said um, you know, that Brian was appointed as the um, first director. He'd replaced John, which we, we knew. Um, and he said Brian had been hatching this dream of a foundation program, an open foundation program, for quite some time. So Don said, I was, I was involved in the initial planning of it with Brian. It was Brian's baby, of course, but he and I, and to a lesser extent John Turner, were involved in the project. And I asked him, can you tell us a little bit about those initial discussions and what motivated the development of Open Foundation? And John said, there weren't so many discussions, it was Brian's <laughs> baby, and he laughed. We tagged along. So I said, what, what was he telling you about the project? And John said, he was telling me of his experience in Britain. Brian was a great Anglophile, of course, and nothing the British did would ever be wrong. And he'd only quite recently spent, I think it must have been about 1971, a year on study leave in Europe, and he'd been most impressed by the Open University and especially their entry requirements, or lack of them, relative lack of them, I suppose. He'd been impressed by the German Open University based in Hagen in then West Germany, and given Brian, he was particularly impressed by the Paris Huit campus at the University of Paris and the Free University of Amsterdam, where much of the student troubles in 1968 in Europe had focused. And Brian was most impressed with the way in which these alternative universities had been established. And he was of a mind to do something similar in Australia. And his first step towards that was a course which allowed anybody who took a liking or had an inkling that they might wish to do further study allowed them to get started and gave them some support and assistance to the point where they would learn whether or not they were suited for and or liked higher education studies. And that was the background to it. That's where Brian was coming from. So he said the University of Newcastle though was not quite um, so keen on the rabble. And there was enormous resistance to the establishment of the Open Foundation course at the time. And J.J. Ockmuty, the Vice-Chancellor at the time, kept delaying decisions that Brian had been asking him to make about whether or not the students at the end of the course would be allowed access or entry to the university. So, when Brian still didn't have an answer, he advertised would be allowed entry at the successful completion of their course. And this rather forced the university's hand. Unfortunately, Brian suffered somewhat for this. He was given a rollicking carpeting by the Vice-Chancellor. And we often thought that one of Brian's many twitches was added to his repertoire as a result of that. And he laughed again. 
because there was a group of us, Bill Warren and others that you know, were sitting in the staff house bar after Brian slunk away from the Vice Chancellor's office and he was rattled. But he did force the university's hand and a decision was made by Brian for the university. And I said to him, I'm interested in the circumstances of that conversation that he had with Ockmuti. And John said, oh, it wasn't a conversation. He said, I don't think there was much conversing going on. I think it was Ockmuti laying down the law about who was boss and what Brian's place in the universe was. But by that time, Brian wasn't alone. He had others. And there were quite significant others. Um, he said Brian was always very nervous about the Open Foundation course. He thought it wouldn't last long. He thought we'd soak up the demand for it within a few years and he wondered what his next step would be because Newcastle was thought not big enough to support it over a long term. He was in his element. He was the gang leader and he played that role to the hilt. He was leading way out in front and he enjoyed doing that. He was in his element, yeah. He was always available for students and I remained enormously impressed. He kept no lecture notes whatsoever and for an hour or so before a lecture he'd get a scrap of paper and it might even be the back of something that he had something roneoed on or a notice and he would scribble and he would scribble in the smallest writing that would be legible. At that time he wasn't wearing pince nez but within a couple of years he was wearing reading glasses and he favoured the pince nez. Um, he was this thin, painfully thin man with a shock of red hair and a grey red beard not looking unlike the man from La Mancha or Rumpelstiltskin. I've forgotten what the character's name was and I said Cat Weasel because I knew other respondents had referred to him in that way. And John said Cat Weasel, that's right, yeah, scribbling away with a tiny cigarette in his mouth, usually much shorter than the hairs on his moustache. And we never understood how he didn't go up in flames. <laughs> and uh, occasionally rubbing his hand through his hair, pushing his shock of hair back, which would fall over his face, and scribbling away and puffing away and then rushing off. So you're getting a bit of the flavour um, of what Brian was like. And, um, you know, he was really quite a creative person, but certainly very committed um, to the program. Um, I was fortunate <coughs> enough to interview um, Laurie Short and Don George before they passed away. And no, it's not the kiss of death that mm -hmm. interviewing uh, <laughs> <laughs> me. There's a lot of them are still um, alive and well. But Laurie's contribution I've mentioned to you um, was certainly in those initial stages. Um, in the interview that I had with him, he was very keen to talk about the demise of the university. He was very concerned about the direction we were going into <coughs> corporatisation. Um, but he certainly remembered um, Brian Smith and, and you know, had that uh, commitment to getting the program um, up and going and committed to the Senate that it was um, you know, a reasonable proposition. Um, Don George came on board as the Vice-Chancellor in 1975 um, and while he said he wasn't directly um, involved in making decisions about Open <coughs> Foundation, nevertheless he had lots of conversations um, with Brian and certainly was never opposed to the sorts of things that um, Brian was wanting to achieve for it. There's JJ Ockmuti, who's already been spoken about, and John, um, whose words you've, you've heard. Um, another person who taught into the program was Godfrey Tanner. And um, Godfrey taught um, a core subject that was offered in the very early days that Brian had um, set up and um, wanted all students to attempt called Political Man, um, which today would be quite an inappropriate um, <laughs> title, but um, within it there was a mixture of um, ancient history, modern history, um, politics, philosophy and economics. And so what he wanted, I guess, was an all-round education, um, introduction for those students to possibly a lot of subjects that they'd never been exposed to before, and then they could choose another subject um, to go alongside that. Um, Professor Brian English was involved with the program as our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic and in fact his uh, interview was interesting in terms of how we came to be federally funded because there was a bit of ledger domain that went on there. Uh, but nevertheless the program continues at this stage anyway to be federally funded, it's free uh, for students and that's really important to um, that open access idea. Um, Bill Warren who was um, in the staff house after um, Brian got his rollicking, also had taught uh, into the program, he taught philosophy. One of the things that he said was that the teaching he did in Open Foundation was the best teaching he ever did in his whole career. 
Um, and I guess in part was that, that was because Brian allowed those lecturers a certain amount of flexibility um, to do um, a bit of experimentation to try what they thought might be interesting and useful. They weren't constrained um, by curriculum and as long as those students were assessed as um, you know, being able to meet the standards of university entry then um, they were given a fair amount of latitude. So in my interviews I've got you know, quite a bit of information that relates to that. The wonderful Margaret Henry was one of our lecturers um, in the course as well. I was so fortunate to interview her before she passed away. Um, and John Turner, and in fact, um, the two of them did a bit of a swap because Margaret had been in the history faculty um, and uh, John was in Open Foundation, and so um, they swapped those roles. And one of the things that Margaret commented to me was that if she'd ever written about Open Foundation, she would have called her paper just a, uh, because she said often, and particularly the mature age women who were in her classes, would come to her and say, I'm just a mother, or I'm just a checkout operator. And Margaret said to me they were so much more than that. Um, and so, you know, there's some stories about some of the, uh, the people uh, that she was involved with along the way. Um, Ralph became our uh, director uh, later on. He'd also taught into the program. And so um, the students often were overjoyed at, um, you know, at learning that philosophy. And so some of the comments on that um, on that t-shirt, one there is, um, truthfully Ralph, you're wonderful, what's truth? <laughs> <laughs> and watch out for slippery slopes, thanks for the new attitude. Um, so there's a whole range of other um, comments and in fact some of the other lecturers that I spoke to also had fantastic gifts that the students had given them. Um, jo Whitehead um, had a trophy that um, one of the women had brought in, she'd sprayed it with new gold paint. Uh, it was a trophy that her um, son had had for soccer and, you know, been out in the shed. Got sprayed up, brought in, best lecturer ever. Um, you know, so some of those touching things, but it also indicates, you know, the, the appreciation, I guess, um, that the students have for the, the lecturers in the course. Here's some of our beautiful English literature uh, lecturers, including Jean Talbot, Ruth Lunny. Um, wonderful people who've you know done amazing things with our students. Um, I got permission from most of my respondents to photograph them, so I'll be including those photographs in the in the thesis. Chapter five is going to be about the reasons um, for enrolling in Open Foundation, and one of the things that was quite interesting there was you would expect if they're coming to do a tertiary preparation course that they'd say, um, you know, they wanted to do it for a new career or, you know, to be educated or something along those lines. And certainly um, a bit over 28% of them gave that response. Um, this was a qualitative response. They could write whatever they wanted. Um, you know, I gave them lines on the survey to do that. And some of them, in fact, um, wrote more than the lines that were provided. They were writing on the back and all over the place. Um, but what was interesting to me was that um, nearly 40% of those 834 responses that I got to that question about the reasons for enrolling related to their self-identity. Um, people were saying they wanted me time, or um, they hadn't, you know, they regret that they they hadn't studied <coughs> earlier, or um, they wanted to prove that they could do it. I mean, in one instance, there was a woman who'd said that she wanted to prove to her dead father. Um, you know, that she was capable academically because he denied her an opportunity on the basis that she was female to pursue an education. Um, for other people it was um, the fact that they didn't know whether they had the ability or not and they were coming to test it out. Um, and so, um, you know, it was quite interesting some of those qualitative responses. For some people it was the right time in their lives. Um, some women it might might be the fact that their child had gone off to preschool, but for others it was the fact that their child had left home or gone to university and they didn't feel that they could relinquish their mothering duties until they were, you know, totally off their hands. Um, but interestingly, about 10% of those responses were about having had a disorienting dilemma. Um, Jack Mesereau talks about the fact that um, often in mature age study, um, people have had some uh, kind of trauma or tragedy that's forced them to rethink their lives and so in my data um, it could have been relationship breakdowns or the death of a baby or a death of a parent or uh, job loss or diagnosis of an illness or something like that. Now interestingly while it was 10% of the, uh, 
the overall responses, it was actually about 23% of all of the respondents. So one in four people roughly had had some kind of disorienting dilemma that had brought them to the course, which I thought was fascinating. Um, for others, it was you know other kinds of external factors. Uh, chapter six is going to be looking at some of those student transformations. So um, one of those questions, as I mentioned before, that I asked them was about their prior qualifications. And in fact, 21 of those people had only had between one and three years of high school education. So I called those people out <coughs> and had a look at their stories. Um, and in fact, um, a couple of them didn't go on and do a degree. They were happy just to do the Open Foundation and feel you know, that they could su uh, succeed. Um, you know, they were satisfied basically by the end of that year and didn't want to uh, continue. Three of them continued but didn't complete. Two of them were still doing their degree at the time of the survey. But look at the other two categories. Eight of them had completed their degree and five of those people who you'd regard as otherwise educationally disadvantaged had gone on to do um, post-grad study. And in fact, the kinds of jobs that some of them did, um, there were four teachers among them, there was a psychologist, there was an academic who was also a dietitian, um, a nurse, an urban and regional environmental planner and a local council, um, a youth worker with um, tertiary qualifications, and a couple of them were still studying. Um, so I thought that was really quite remarkable for, you know, for people who um, hadn't had those opportunities to uh, continue their education earlier. Some of the other transformations that I'll look at in that chapter are the fact that in the whole sample there was about 16.5% of them um, who went on and did postgraduate qualifications. I think there was 20 in my sample with PhDs, um, but altogether 58 people and, uh, who'd gone on and that, that concept of lifelong learning certainly um, you know, could be applied there. Um, I had Indigenous students, um, I've got students with disabilities and I'll be looking at their stories a bit more closely. Um, students that did the course when they were past retiring age, you know, why, what were their motivations and so on. Um, students who already had university qualifications, which um, theoretically you're not supposed to do the Open Foundation course if you're already, um, you know, eligible to attend university. Um, but I recall that one of those people uh, was a barrister who had studied at law, wanted to come back um, and do the humanities, do some histories and English literature. Um, so I'll be having a look at those stories a bit more closely um, and recording them in the thesis as well. 22 of the respondents were um, in the distance program, so I'll look at what happened to them. Um, but lots and lots of stories of um, life change that I'll be recounting there. Um, so I asked them that question, you know, did Open Foundation change your life? And of those 350 people, there was more than 95% of them said, yes, it did. Um, so, you know, it led to further education, but a lot of them said it made them much more confident, not just academically, but also in their social relationships. Um, there were only 16 people who said that there was no change at all. So, you know, that's... Um, you know, about four and a half percent of them. So the majority of them certainly, you know, did think that it changed their lives. Chapter seven is going to look at the broader impacts of Open Foundation. So um, their career destinations that I'll, I'll um, give you a look at in a moment. Um, and the way I'm looking at that is almost like, you know, the student at the centre, what happened to them, you know, what economic impacts, um, you know, related to them as an individual and any, you know, social family changes. Um, but I'm interested also in the impacts for the university. So, um, you know, what, what were those connections to the community? Uh, the fact that Open Foundation, I believe, um, provides the university with an enhanced reputation. Um, and also looking at the extent of the undergraduate intake because um, it's been between about 15 and some years it's been as much as 20% of the undergraduate intake from the whole enabling programs of which Open Foundation is one of those um, areas. Um, but certainly in the region, one of the things that I looked at was, um, you know, were we training these people up and they were moving away with these wonderful qualifications? And in fact, no, that wasn't the case. 95% of them um, stayed in the region. Um, so, you know, they're employees, they're professionals in lots of different fields, but also that idea of having an educated population um, certainly applies. So in terms of the uh, careers, because not all of them had finished their degrees, um, they completed the survey, but 
Um, we had academics, administrators, um, architects, there was a couple of architects there, artists, uh, people in business areas, environmental scientists, um, people, well one person in dispute resolution, but IT, software development, um, journalists, you'd be aware that Joan McCarthy, the Walkley Women Award winning journalist, was one of our Open Foundation students. Oh. Um, we had lawyers, um, there was a migration agent, lots of people in the health field. There was only one medical doctor, but I know there are quite a lot of medical doctors who've come through the program. Um, but, you know, people um, in all sorts of health professions, um, occupational health and safety, psychologists, um, researchers, public service, um, people who are involved in policy production. Um, we've got a sexologist over at the University of Western Australia. Um, there was also a guy that was studying astronomy. I don't think he became an astronomer as such, but certainly he'd done a master's degree in astronomy. Um, but social workers, lots of teachers at all different levels. Um, we've got a veterinarian, a girl that um, didn't do so well in her HSC, um, and in fact, you know, failed some subjects in first year science when she came um, into university, but persevered, and now she's a, a veterinarian. Um, but also youth workers, so you can see um, there's a huge diversity of different careers that they go mm -hmm. into. Uh, chapter 8 is looking at the embodied learning impacts and so Chris Schilling, um, a sociologist, has talked about the fact that um, people have forgotten about the, the body. You know, you focus so much um, on theory, what about the corporeal? Um, and so I was interested in that because in the surveys it came out that um, quite a lot of people <coughs> were saying that they really enjoyed the course, you know, they'd internalised that, that joy of learning. Um, and so I'll be looking at that a little bit um, more closely. A lot of them talked about their identity, but I'm also interested in that um, feeling aspect of, um, you know, what that created. I looked at those responses in terms um, of what I've regarded as positive kinds of comments. Um, and others that were challenging. And so you'll see there that there are far less um, responses that related to things that, you know, that were uh, challenging when they talked about it as being difficult or daunting or stressful. Not very many of those comments, but a lot of comments um, that were, um, you know, really quite favourable, like there was um, fantastic and bloody fantastic um, <laughs> people were saying. Chapter 9 is looking at the longevity um, of the program and also the teaching philosophy of the staff. Um, there's been a number of reviews that have been <coughs> undertaken of Open Foundation over time by very distinguished academics um, and they've commended the program um, and said you know, it only needed um, tweaking here and there. Um, so rather than soaking up the demand um, for these students, as, as Brian had anticipated, what I'm um, showing is that Open Foundation continues to be a very strong mode of non-traditional entry um, and also that um, gathering interview data from the experienced and long-term lecturers in the program provides insights into um, how the program's gained its positive rep uh, reputation because it's not just um, you know the what the students learn it's also you know that reciprocal um, process of the teaching and learning together. Um, so typical of the responses um, is what Dr Barry Hodges had to say in his interview. Um, he said, my philosophy as teaching is that education essentially should be liberating. The best way to make education liberating is to make it non-threatening non but challenging, fun but preparatory of hard work, um, open so inclusive but funnily that's um, gradually excluding certain characteristics that is capacity not to organise yourself and not to work hard, those sorts of things. So you open it up to everybody early on, but then you funnel that down so that the people who are firstly retained, that is, people are retained in one of two ways, either because they're getting trained better in it, or secondly, the ones who are not prepared to make that change, whether they're not prepared through um, real issues or because it's too steep a learning curve, now tend to drop out of it. You're learning now more and more that um, the kinds of cultural stuff, the educational capital um, that you need to be a successful student and learning how to learn um, is a crucial part of that, and that's part of the challenge. Um, so I've gathered a lot of those kinds of comments and I'll be looking at them um, collectively. So finally, um, what the thesis is doing is providing historical insights um, that only the telling through people's lived experiences can offer. You can't get some of those accounts through the official documentation. 
um, Open Foundation's impacted the university. It's now very strategic um, to its enrolment as well as a conduit you know, that the community has um, to further education. But it's also important for the regions in creating that educated population. Um, an overwhelming majority of students reported that it changed their lives. Um, so many of those people transitioned in rich and diverse um, occupations and even those who didn't pursue careers indicated that the experience had been mostly rewarding. So according to the data, the majority of students remained in their region, enriching the occupational structures, demonstrating the benefits of a widening participation agenda, which not all of which is economic. Um, Paolo Freire coined the term consignitisation to discuss the fundamental shift that occurs in the perspective of learners when they gain a new awareness and way of seeing themselves as having options to control their lives, which they may previously have seen as beyond their control. So what I'm arguing is that for many of these students, the institutionalised, in other words the credentials, and the embodied cultural capital, as well as the habitus they acquire from Open Foundation, um, provided opportunities that they'd never dreamt of. And one student who became a social worker said, doing the course was eye-opening as to the areas of study and career options that, they were previously, that were previously unknown or unreachable. I realised I was capable of studying at university level, smarter than I thought I was. Without the support of the staff, I would have never had the courage or ability to attempt to attend university. So, thank you for... having worked in the program for 21 years is that there tends to be more of a, a vocational orientation so there is a lot more students that are going into um, nursing and teaching now than had been uh, the case before um, but in general I think um, Open Foundation is popular because of word of mouth you know people tell other people um, about you know the kind of opportunities that are afforded to them and so what I think is happening is that there are a lot of working class people who may previously have just not thought um, that higher education was possible at all, that are learning from the people around them. You know, it could be from, um, from their families. Like in the data, I've got a grandmother who um, decided that she would come to Open Foundation to be a role model for her grandson and teach him, you know, some good habits. Um, but she said that didn't happen, unfortunately. <laughs> she had a really good time. Um, so, yeah, so I, I suppose, you know, it is a conduit for people from, um, you know, low socioeconomic circumstances, but also, um, you know, for Indigenous people, um, for people, you know, who dropped out of school early, uh, for people with disabilities and so on. And in fact, um, some of the data that I've got about the students with disabilities, um, there's one young fellow that I'm thinking of who um, had a diving accident and a, a spinal injury. Um, and he said something like, you know, I came along just to, um, you know, to see whether I could do it because um, I wanted to put back into the community what had been given to me during my rehabilitation. And he said the lecturers that he had um, believed in him even more than he believed in himself. And that was the catalyst um, for getting him through. Um, so, you know, I think there's so much diversity out there. I mean, obviously there are people who, well, for example, um, one year I was teaching a woman who was already a book editor. And so when the students come into our classes, you just don't know what their educational level is going to be. It's not some, you know, information that you're appraised of beforehand. Um, so if you're dealing with somebody whose literacy skills are at that level, compared to somebody who's dropped out at the end of year seven, although that's not happening now, those people in that data, you know, that, that was some time ago, the schools don't allow them to, um, to leave at that age now. Um, but, you know, there, there's just such a huge diversity and um, also people that have had really negative 
um, experiences at school so often um, were approached and students will say, um, you know, my teacher told me that I would never amount to anything. Mm. Um, and so they're relearning the joy of education um, and, you know, hopefully I guess the experience of the lecturers encourages them to, um, you know, to take their abilities where, you know, wherever they can, they can go because they must have some belief in themselves to sign up in the first place. You know, there's something that they're telling themselves at that point um, that hopefully then, and not all of them stay, you know, there is a large dropout rate, um, but at the same time, what's really heartening is that all of those people come back, it's just not the right time, um, and they come back to us later on. So, um, you know, the proportion of people that do it in the region, um, you know, is quite astonishing. In fact, um, just out of interest, can you put your hand up if you were an Open Foundation student in this room? Look at that. Um, so, you know, they're everywhere. Uh, great presentation, great project. Uh, I've got a number of questions, but one that I think is related to, to that one. Um, you looked at the reasons for enrolment. Have you looked at mapping those reasons over time? Because it seems to me there would be a significant change in those reasons across the period. No, I didn't look at it in, in a temporal way and also um, given the fact that seven, nearly 78% of my respondents were female, what you're getting overwhelmingly there is a female voice coming through. Um, and it's not that um, you know, men haven't done the program, it's, um, I think the last time I looked at the data for ELFS in 2013 it was something like 56% of um, people who were enrolled were women. Um, and I think right back to the early times, there were generally more women who enrolled than men, but I'm seeing lots more young men these days um, who are coming along. So there is a changing demographic. Mm. So Actually, that was, that was going to be my question. Great presentation, Rosalie, and I'm looking forward to including the whole thesis. Me my too. Question was, what was the <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question was exactly that. What's the mix uh, in the program in general, um, given that 78% of the uh, Response, yeah. yeah, well it's really quite quite diverse actually and, and you're always astonished. Like I had a visit um, just the week before last from um, one of my <coughs> former students who's in his 80s um, and he's quite a rascal. Um, he got off into his undergraduate degree and started using his critical thinking approach to torment the historians. Oh. <laughs> Nancy was one of those, she knows who I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, it was fabulous that, you know, they were taking those skills on board and then, um, you know, putting them into action. <laughs> when I was teaching at the former Warrigal High School back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was a a, an unemployment crisis and a lot of our year 10 students who should have gone on did they went out to take apprenticeships and the like and I believe that was the same in many other schools. Is there anything in your research that indicates that those kinds of people have come back into academics? Well I don't know whether you noticed in the data that the highest proportion of people when I asked them about their prior education actually had done the school certificate. Um, there was a number who had gone to year 11 or year 12 or beyond, um, but I think it was more than 40%, um, you know, were, were school certificate um, leavers. So there's definitely, um, you know, a lot of people that have come through that were in that category. You know, they see the opportunity later on. And I'm thinking one of, of one of them who went to Borrigal High School, um, she became a social worker. She left school at 15, um, travelled the world, and then decided um, when she was in her 50s that she'd come back and you know have another go at education. She was quite bright at the time, but again, another one of those that um, you know in the, in the thinking of the day um, didn't see that you know continuing education was useful for women. Um, but she became a social worker at the James Fletcher Hospital mm -hmm. um, and had a lovely career before she eventually retired. Um, there's one lady in the in the data that um, came to us at 45 and successfully completed an architecture degree and had a wonderful career as an architect for a number of years mm. before she retired. So there's all those kinds of really interesting stories that I'm going to tease out um, in the thesis. Mm. Uh, yeah. um, your respondents presumably were self-selected 
Yes. So yes. The skeptical historian in me says, <laughs> where, 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 where there are there any critical comments about the Open Foundation? Are you building a kind of critique of the Open Foundation program into your thesis? Well, I'm well? not doing that so much, I guess, because remember there are only 16 people who said that it hadn't changed their lives. Um, that can be somebody else's thesis, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I'm not, you know, sort of not acknowledging um, that that doesn't exist. And in fact, in my interview data, um, one of my respondents was commenting that a neighbour of his had um, come to do um, physics. I don't know whether he was in the engineering field, but he chose physics and he, he chose um, science maths, which was the highest level of maths that you could do. He got into those subjects and what it did for him purportedly was confirm that he wasn't bright enough to do it, but he'd chosen the two <laughs> hardest subjects, I, I would say, um, in the whole course and he just couldn't cope with them. Um, so again, you know, there's that element that goes on and where, you know, where people locate themselves. But um, one of the things that I have said in a number of the papers that I've given is that um, it is a self-selected sample, so I can't generalise to the whole group. Um, but gee, I would love to track down all those like 26,000 people, or however many it is that have come through, and ask all of them because I think it, it wouldn't be dissimilar the picture that's built up than um, you know than the one that I've already collected. Two. Um, I was one. The teachers sound very good, don't they? The ones that you've mentioned. How were they selected, or how did they get involved? Um, in the course, that's one question. And the other thing is, I know a, a Timaru student who had did that course last year under its new title, English Language. So she's coming in in a, a very different way. It's like a preparation for her to do, I mean, she would have done her leaving what it's called in Timor, so before she goes on to do her degree. So is it being used for quite different things now as well? Well, in the English Language and Foundation Studies Centre, um, there's a number of programs. We've got the ELICOS, which teaches the language. Um, we've got Open Foundation. We've got the New Step for the younger students. Um, and we've got YAPAG, which is you know, for the Indigenous students. Um, so I'm not sure whether she's doing Open Foundation or whether she's in those language no, programs. She, 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 oh, OK. So I, I just thought yeah, you said that was the new title. Yeah, but, but I think... Wrong. More and more, there's more research being done in that area, um, and particularly um, uh, looking at refugees that are coming into the program as well. So that's a really great initiative. Um, mm -hmm. Sally might be able to tell you a bit more about that. Um, and that teachers. research. How, how did they get so Well, brilliant? that's a good question, having never been on a selection panel. But <laughs> I guess we could turn that over to Carol because um, she has done the selecting. So, Carol, what are some of the qualities that you look for? Uh, um, being put on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the one of the I was talking to Anna just uh, a little while ago, and, and one of the things that that we feel is important, or we have felt is important in Open Foundation, is that we need to select staff who uh, who are more interested in the students than they are in themselves. <laughs> <laughs> How do you how do you find that? Well, well that is tricky, but but um, uh, part of it is creating that culture around uh, around our, our teaching environment and um, um, encouraging the staff to develop themselves in that way. Um, and um, it's a bit of an ego thing, I guess. We need people who are who are strong enough in themselves not to need. Um, to, to get a buzz back from students to feed their own egos. So it's students who, it, it's staff who are, who are very centered, very mature in their approach to other people um, and, and can carry that, um, uh, that nurturing role alongside the, the intellectual learning role in, in balance with that, with that um, you know, without dropping the student all the way. I don't know that that answers the question, but it's it, it's certainly a very complex process. Um, I might exercise convener privilege to ask uh, the last question before we break for morning tea. Um, I'm interested in, um, you were talking about distance students. Yes. 
Um, and obviously, this is, you know we're, we're kind of in this time where we're being encouraged to embrace online learning. Um, we're hearing about universities scrapping face-to-face -face lectures entirely. So I'm wondering if, when you're thinking about um, these students coming through and kind of um, acquiring an increased sense of cultural capital, whether you notice a difference between the students who are enrolled on campus and those students who are enrolled through distance um, programs, like whether there's something um, inherent about actually being on the campus and, and kind of engaging with what's happening on campus versus um, kind of being a bit more self-directed. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to look at that yet, but 22 of my respondents were distance students. Um, but I certainly, um, in some of the interviews with staff who talk into the distance program, um, I've got some of those insights. So, for example, um, one of our lecturers was um, in a tutorial with a student uh, who was in the armed forces, and, and that, that person wasn't allowed to say where they were, but it was somewhere with lots of sand. Um, and apparently there were bombs ha happening in the background and eventually the students said, I've got to go. Um, <laughs> there's other you know, things happening, but interesting stories like that. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, amongst those 22 people who indicated that they were in the distance program, um, that I'll be able to get some of those insights from them. But again, more research in that area, <coughs> you know, would be fantastic. Um, okay, well, it is now 11, so if you join me in thanking Rosalie for...